response to an earlier Israeli airstrike on a Gaza residential building. Among the dead in another Israeli... Right now. It's a race against time. Move now, leave your stuff, go! The fire's at the back, go! Right now, there is no go back. Everything that is going to happen is in front of us. Global tensions are escalating, new diseases are emerging, and destructive insect infestations plague desert areas. Simultaneously, Germany is grappling with a surge in natural disasters and abnormal weather, seemingly pleading for divine intervention. These events have sparked widespread speculation about the end times, with biblical prophecies appearing to unfold before our eyes. Are we overstating the significance of these occurrences? Wars, famines, diseases, and extreme events are undeniably prevalent. But is this era truly exceptional or merely a recurring pattern in history? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. Revelation. A warning. Repent. Love, mercy, faith, truth, grace, salvation, love your neighbor as yourself, wisdom, love in Jesus Christ. Name, amen, repent, mercy. Matthew 21, 33. <laughs> The recent storm that devastated Germany, particularly the Black Forest region encompassing Baden-Württemberg, Bavaria, and Hesse, has left many in shock. Was it merely a natural disaster or a sign from above? Let's explore this together. On that fateful day, an unbelievably fierce storm swept through Germany's heartland. The previously tranquil Black Forest was ravaged by violent tornadoes, uprooting ancient trees and leaving a path of destruction. In Frankfurt, powerful winds battered skyscrapers, shattering windows and plunging the city into darkness. The relentless rain turned streets into raging rivers, sweeping away everything in its path. The sky over Berlin became ominously dark. Thunder roared, a chilling reminder of nature's raw power. Amidst this storm, a terrifying vision appeared. A fiery dragon, with blazing eyes, materialized within the storm clouds, spewing fire and smoke, enveloping the land in a menacing embrace. This frightening spectacle echoed biblical imagery of the dragon, symbolizing the forces of evil wreaking havoc on God's creation. Even Germany, a nation renowned for its technological advancement and prosperity, couldn't escape the storm's fury. Lightning bolts, resembling divine weapons, lit up the night sky, momentarily turning darkness into day. The earth shook beneath the thunderous roar, sending tremors through building foundations. A wave of awe and fear swept over those who witnessed this display of raw, untamed power. The plagues are being unleashed because Jesus is not taking humanity's disobedience lightly. We must repent of our sins, humble ourselves and turn back to God, abandoning our wicked ways in every nation. 2 Chronicles 7.14 I tell you, this bad weather has been relentless, so we want to get right to those mandatory evacuations out west. In the aftermath, the Ruhr urban area of Germany resembled a battlefield. Roads were shattered and cracked, historic landmarks lay in ruins, and once vibrant communities were reduced to rubble. The storm's impact was severe, both in terms of human suffering and the destruction of infrastructure. Lives were lost, families were torn apart, and the environment was scarred. In another startling event, Munich, a city rich in history and diversity, became the epicenter of inexplicable phenomena. Videos purportedly capturing ethereal trumpet blasts echoing through the Munich skies, along with images allegedly showing Jesus Christ projected onto the clouds, circulated widely, sparking both spiritual fervor and profound questions. The nation's attention turned to Munich, but it was the ground beneath that revealed the next astonishing event. All those who attack people of faith, denounce God, and mock Him, will not be saved. It's too late to start begging now. 
They had their chance and chose the wrong path. In a dramatic twist, Munich has been besieged not by military forces, but by a biblical-scale plague of locusts emerging from a 20-year dormancy. The swarm, so vast it blots out the sun, evokes chilling parallels to the plagues described in ancient scriptures. This is not a scene from a disaster movie, but the stark reality facing Germany in 2024, a year marked by an event so rare it defies living memory. The resurgence of locusts in Germany has sparked discussions about divine signs, with many interpreting the swarm as a modern manifestation of the wonders and omens found in sacred texts. These signs, reminiscent of the guiding star of Bethlehem or the pillar of fire leading the Israelites, evoke memories of a time when the hand of God directly shaped the destiny of nations. They serve as powerful symbols, capturing the imaginations of those who believe they herald significant spiritual transformations. As we reflect on these catastrophic events, let us turn to our faith for guidance and solace. It's because we've turned our backs on God, not taken care of the earth, and excluded him from our schools and courtrooms. We haven't made room for him in our lives or society. God cares about everything he's created, but he needs to be part of our daily lives. Man has pushed him away, done things their own way, and now the earth is in chaos. God is not pleased. Repent, people, for Jesus' return is near and mankind is only getting worse. The Bible reminds us that while nature is formidable, we are not alone in our struggles. Through prayer and unity, we can find strength and resilience in the face of adversity. Let us remember the words of Psalm 46, 1-2. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Let us pray for Germany during this time of turmoil. In the midst of unprecedented natural disasters and unsettling signs, we are confronted with the reality of God's sovereignty and the profound implications of His commandments to love Him and our neighbors. These events, reminiscent of biblical narratives and prophetic warnings, serve as a clarion call for repentance and spiritual awakening. In the face of divine warnings and calls for repentance, let us not be consumed by fear or despair, but instead be spurred to action. May we emulate the selfless love demonstrated by the Samaritan, recognizing that in doing so, we reflect the heart of God himself. As we lift up prayers for nations afflicted by calamity, let us also examine our own hearts and lives, seeking forgiveness for our failures to love as God commands. May our repentance be genuine, leading to transformation and a renewed commitment to walk in obedience and humility before our Creator. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly, acknowledging our shortcomings and the gravity of the times in which we live. We repent for our neglect of loving you with all our hearts and failing to love our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, and grant us the strength and wisdom to live out these commandments each day. We lift up the nations affected by natural disasters, particularly Germany and France, asking for your mercy and protection over the people in the land. Bring comfort to those who are suffering, strength to those who are weary, and hope to those who are despairing. May your presence be felt amidst the chaos and uncertainty, reassuring your children of your unfailing love and faithfulness. This disaster is reminding us to go to God, repent for all our sins, and God will forgive us, and follow his commandments to love thy God with all our hearts, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and love thy neighbor just as he loves us. Similar to the events in Munich, a viral TikTok video captured strange phenomena in France just before a major earthquake. Eerie sounds and unusual weather patterns were recorded, including loud thumps and flashes of red and blue light in the night sky, followed by a deafening siren-like noise. This unexplained event has sparked fear and speculation, especially since a similar phenomenon was witnessed in the German skies during their recent storm. In the wake of the recent natural disasters that have ravaged Germany, Many are interpreting these events as a manifestation of God's wrath. The concept of divine anger is not a trivial matter. While we often focus on God's benevolent attributes, the Bible extensively discusses His wrath. Terms like God's anger, God's wrath, and God's fury appear frequently, underscoring the seriousness of this theme. In the New King James Version alone, God's wrath is directly mentioned 64 times with an additional 56 occurrences using the possessive pronoun his, totaling 120 explicit references. 
Beyond these, approximately 100 more verses allude to God's wrath, anger, or fury in various contexts, bringing the total to around 220 mentions. To grasp the balance of God's character, we can look to Psalm 103, which is a hymn of praise for God's blessings and mercies. By verse 8, it celebrates His mercy and grace, reminding us that even amidst discussions of divine wrath, God's compassion remains ever-present. As Germany cries out for mercy and turns to Jesus Christ in these trying times, it echoes the biblical plea for divine grace and foreshadows the belief that Jesus is coming soon. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Psalm 103.8 But let us balance this out a little bit. Let us go back to Psalm 7. Notice this part of God's character. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 7.11 So, you have that perspective here from a man who knew God intimately, David, the psalmist. David, despite his many failings, saw God not as an unrelenting force of anger, but as a source of grace and mercy. Consider his sin with Bathsheba. David committed adultery, and yet God did not immediately unleash his wrath upon him. God showed restraint and patience, allowing nearly nine months to pass before the prophet Nathan confronted David with his sin. During this period, God could have justifiably been angry with David, but instead, he gave David time to repent. However, when David's repentance came, it was clear that God's wrath, while tempered with mercy, was inevitable. The child born of this sin did not survive. This account reflects the complex nature of God's character as depicted in the scriptures. He is both merciful and just. In these recent disasters in Germany, some may see parallels to the biblical narratives of divine wrath and mercy. As the nation grapples with these calamities, there is a collective turning towards Jesus Christ seeking mercy and forgiveness, much like David did. The cry for mercy from Germany underscores a broader spiritual awakening and the hope that Jesus is coming soon. This duality of God's character, his capacity for both wrath and mercy, is a reminder that in times of suffering, turning to divine grace offers a path to redemption and hope. Even though God's anger did not immediately manifest towards David, he was indeed angry at his sin. David's great wickedness required a period of reflection and repentance, and God allowed him to endure the consequences and guilt for a long time to see what he would do. It took a significant shock, Nathan's confrontation, for David to repent. Thus, as David rejoiced in Psalm 103, we too can be grateful that God gives us a chance to repent before he ultimately enacts his justice. We must consider these seemingly opposite aspects of God's nature his abundant mercy and patience alongside his righteous anger. These are not contradictions, but integral parts of God's holy and righteous character. While God is merciful and slow to anger, he is also just and becomes angry at sin daily. He is a just judge, and his anger is directed towards the sins committed by the wicked. God's goodness is evident in his call to repentance, offering us his spirit and the chance to build a relationship with him. However, this opportunity comes with the responsibility to continue in righteousness. If we fail to do so, we risk experiencing his severity. These two sides of God's nature, goodness and severity, cannot be separated. In fact, God's wrath is an aspect of his love. His severity is a manifestation of his goodness. This is echoed in Paul's words in Romans 11. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness on the one side and the severity of God on the other. On those who fell, severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans 11, 21, 22. It is an act of love for God to punish sinners in wrath, providing true and equitable justice and eliminating evil. God's love for his people compels him to remove evil from their environment. While he doesn't always act immediately or completely in this age, his ultimate goal is to eradicate all evil, ensuring holiness and righteousness so that the Father can dwell with us. God's desire is not only to eliminate evil, but also to inspire repentance. He prefers repentance over destruction, 
he would rather see an evil person transformed into good than eliminated. Thus, his anger serves a purpose. To produce righteous character. Whether through love, wrath, or a combination of both, God will use whatever means necessary to bring about change and repentance. In light of the recent disasters in Germany, this understanding of God's nature is particularly poignant. As the nation seeks mercy and turns to Jesus Christ, it echoes the biblical call for repentance and divine grace. The cry for mercy amidst suffering highlights the hope that Jesus is coming soon, offering redemption and a path to righteousness. Such inexplicable occurrences align with biblical prophecies about the end times, suggesting that we are witnessing extraordinary events beyond human understanding. These events serve as a wake-up call, urging us to be vigilant and mindful of the impending judgment. They are a resounding echo of God's trumpet, signaling the fulfillment of biblical prophecies. The opening of the sixth seal in Revelation, marking the beginning of the Great Tribulation, reveals a series of cataclysmic events prophesied in Scripture. Earthquakes, a darkening sun, a blood-red moon, and falling stars paint a vivid picture of cosmic upheaval and divine judgment. These events, foretold by prophets of old, signify the approaching day of the Lord, a time of reckoning and redemption. For Christians, these signs echo the warnings found throughout the Bible. Jesus himself spoke of wars, famines, and earthquakes as birth pangs signaling the end times, Matthew 24, 6-8. The Apostle Paul warned of perilous times filled with ungodliness and deception, 2 Timothy 3, 1-5. These signs, while alarming, are not meant to instill fear, but to awaken us to the urgency of the hour. As the chaos escalates, we must remember that our ultimate battle is not against earthly forces, but against spiritual powers of evil. As Paul urges in Ephesians 6.12, we must put on the full armor of God to stand firm against the enemy's schemes. In these turbulent times, the message of Revelation offers hope and assurance to believers. The sounding of the trumpets, while signaling devastation, also heralds the ultimate triumph of good over evil. The sixth trumpet, with its plagues and destruction, serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of sin and the importance of repentance. As Christians, we are called to interpret these signs with discernment, recognizing them as a divine call to turn back to God. By remaining faithful and steadfast in our faith, we can find hope and peace even amidst the chaos of the end times. Let us not be discouraged, but instead, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12.2. In conclusion, the signs of the end times, rather than being a source of fear, should serve as a powerful reminder of God's ultimate authority and the promise of redemption for those who remain faithful. As we navigate these turbulent times, let us stand firm in our belief for our salvation is closer than ever. The second coming of Jesus Christ is a central tenet of Christian faith, signifying the fulfillment of numerous prophecies throughout the Bible. From the Old Testament to the New, Scripture speaks of a time when Christ will return to establish His kingdom and judge the world. In the Old Testament, prophecies like Daniel 7, 13, 14 paint a vivid picture of Christ's return as a triumphant figure, coming with the clouds of heaven to receive dominion and glory. Zechariah 14.19 describes the battle of Armageddon and Christ's ultimate victory, while Isaiah 11.1-10 speaks of his peaceful reign, ushering in an era of harmony and justice. These prophecies hold immense significance for believers. They affirm our faith in the return of Christ and inspire us to live in anticipation of His arrival. The signs of the end times serve as a call to strengthen our relationship with God, to be watchful and prepared for His return. The second coming of Christ offers hope and assurance, a promise of eternal life and a new heaven and earth where righteousness dwells. As we await the fulfillment of these prophecies, let us hold fast to our faith, living in obedience to God's word and sharing the good news of salvation with others. The return of Christ is not just an event to be feared but a glorious moment of hope and redemption. Let us be prepared to meet our King with joy and anticipation. The second coming of Jesus Christ, a cornerstone of Christian faith, is prophesied throughout Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. Matthew 24, 30, 31, 
vividly describes Christ's return in power and glory, accompanied by angels and a resounding trumpet call. Other passages, such as 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17 and Revelation 19, 11 to 16, detail the rapture of the church and Christ's triumph over evil as a warrior king. These prophecies resonate deeply with believers, serving as a reminder of God's promises and the hope of eternal life. Furthermore, the signs preceding Christ's return, as outlined in the Bible, have particular relevance today. Jesus himself warned of wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes as birth pangs leading to his return, Matthew 24, 6, 8. In today's world, we see these very signs unfolding before our eyes. Global conflicts, widespread hunger, and natural disasters are becoming increasingly prevalent. The rise of lawlessness and wickedness, as described in Matthew 24, 12, is another sign we witness in our society. The erosion of moral values and the increasing acceptance of sin are clear indicators of the times we live in. Another significant sign is the emergence of false prophets and messiahs, as foretold in Matthew 24, 24. In our modern age, countless individuals and groups claim to have the answers or offer a path to salvation, leading many astray. However, amidst these troubling signs, there is also a sign of hope, the preaching of the gospel to all nations, Matthew 24, 14. The message of salvation is reaching even the remotest corners of the world, fulfilling this prophecy and bringing hope to countless souls. These signs point to the imminence of Christ's return, a time of both judgment and redemption. The rapture of the church, described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, will be a momentous event where believers will be united with Christ. Following the rapture, a period of tribulation will ensue, as described in the book of Revelation. This time will be marked by unprecedented turmoil and suffering, culminating in the rise of the Antichrist, a figure of immense power and deception who will oppose God and his people. The Antichrist, a central figure in biblical prophecy, is often viewed as a symbol of ultimate evil and opposition to God. His appearance will be a sign of the end times and a catalyst for the final battle between good and evil. Understanding the Antichrist's role is crucial for believers, as it reinforces the importance of remaining vigilant and discerning in our faith. However, the tribulation will not be the end. Jesus Christ will return in glory to defeat the Antichrist and establish his eternal kingdom. As Isaiah 9, 6-7 declares, He will rule with justice and righteousness, ushering in an era of peace and prosperity. As we reflect on these prophecies, let us be filled with hope and anticipation for the coming of our Savior. Let us remain steadfast in our faith, sharing the good news of salvation and living in a manner that honors God. For as Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 44, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. For Christians, believing in the second coming of Jesus is a source of immense hope and comfort. It assures us of a future reunion with our Lord and Savior, motivates us to live a life that honors him and gives us a sense of purpose as we strive to fulfill his will and share the gospel with others. To remain steadfast in our faith as we await Christ's return, we must actively engage with God's word through regular Bible reading and study. This deepens our understanding of his will and equips us to live in accordance with it. Prayer is also essential, as it allows us to seek God's guidance and strength for the journey ahead. Additionally, fellowship with other believers through church services and small groups provides invaluable support and encouragement. Understanding the prophecies and signs surrounding the second coming of Jesus is vital. The hope of eternal life in his kingdom, as promised in Psalm 24, 9-10, is a source of great joy and anticipation. This psalm beautifully captures the excitement and reverence with which we await the arrival of our glorious King. As we eagerly await Christ's return, let us diligently walk with God, obeying His word and sharing the message of salvation with others. Let us keep our hearts and minds focused on the promise of His kingdom, where we will live in His presence forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we navigate these turbulent times, let us turn to the scriptures for they are a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Psalm 119, 105. The signs and prophecies we witness today echo the ancient warnings and promises found within God's holy word. 
They remind us that we are engaged in a spiritual battle for our hearts, minds, and souls. From the prophets of the Old Testament, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, to the apostles of the New Testament, like John and Revelation, God has revealed glimpses of His divine plan throughout history. These prophecies are not mere predictions, but a testament to God's sovereignty and His desire to guide us through the ages. They reveal the cyclical nature of human rebellion and the consequences of turning away from God's righteousness. As we delve deeper into prophecy, we uncover a profound truth. God's word transcends time and space. The wisdom of the ancients resonates with the challenges we face today, reminding us that the battle between good and evil is eternal. Yet, amidst the turmoil, God's light shines even brighter, guiding us toward truth and righteousness. The prophecies of various cultures, from the Aztecs to the Hopi, echo this universal message of spiritual awakening and the need for humanity to return to God's loving embrace. They warn of the dangers of straying from His path and the importance of living in harmony with His creation. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, God promises, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This call to repentance reminds us that our choices today shape the destiny of our world. As we face the uncertainties of the future, let us not be consumed by fear or despair. Instead, let us cling to the hope and wisdom found in God's word. The prophecies and signs we see around us are not meant to frighten us, but to awaken us to the reality of God's plan and his ultimate victory over evil. In Ephesians 6, 10-18, we are reminded to put on the full armor of God, so that we may stand firm against the schemes of the devil. With the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we can face any challenge with confidence and courage. As we navigate these turbulent times, let us be guided by the light of God's Word, the wisdom of prophecy, and the hope of salvation. By seeking His face, turning from our wicked ways and embracing His truth, we can not only overcome the challenges before us, but also become beacons of hope in a world that desperately needs His love and grace. As we delve deeper into the signs of the end times and the call for repentance, it becomes evident that understanding and living out God's commandments to love one another are integral to navigating these turbulent times and preparing for Christ's return. The prophetic signs serve as a wake-up call urging us to be vigilant and mindful of God's ultimate authority and the promise of redemption. In this context, the biblical principle of loving God and loving our neighbors takes on profound significance. These principles are not merely theoretical, but are meant to be lived out in our daily lives, as exemplified by the parable of the Good Samaritan. This timeless message of compassion and mercy resonates with believers today inspiring us to emulate Christ's love as we await His glorious return. A well-known principle of Bible study is that repetition is among the best forms of emphasis. If God states something once, it is important, and if twice, it is even more important. The Bible contains the phrase that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart five times, Deuteronomy 6, 5, 11, 1, Matthew 22, 37, Mark 12, 30, Luke 10, 27 we had better take it to heart. However, we are told to love your neighbor eight times, Leviticus 19.18, Matthew 5.43, 19.19, Mark 12.31, Romans 13.9, Galatians 5.14, James 2.8. The additional repetitions do not make this command more important than the one to love God, but they perhaps suggest that we tend to neglect loving our neighbors, and so need to be reminded of it more frequently. It may also suggest that learning to love our neighbors is more difficult than we tend to think. What is this love that we are to have and show fellow man? The Greek word for love in this command is agapao, Strong's 25. To have a warm regard for and interest in another, cherish, have affection for. This seems like a rather general definition of any kind of love, but Jesus elevates it to an unconditional love, a heartfelt response to do good for another as the occasion requires no matter who the other is, whether family, friend, enemy, or person on the street. Showing this kind love to our neighbor, then, goes far beyond wishing him well, 
but extends to actively doing him good. It does not mean doing what will please him, but choosing to benefit him by showing him favor and goodwill. The outworking of this love may involve expressions of kindness or providence, or it could even be giving discipline and punishment. Its emphasis is on doing what is good for him, not on whether it will necessarily please him. Then we must ask, who is my neighbor? This question is asked of Jesus, and he replies with the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 25-37. The text tells us that this expert in the law wished to justify himself, that is, show himself to be in the right on this matter and thus excuse his behavior. He had no argument regarding loving God, and as for loving his neighbor, he may have indeed been a good neighbor, as instructed by the pharisaical interpretation of the law. Generally, that interpretation essentially boils down to, love your neighbor, as long as they are not Gentiles. Some Pharisees carried this to extremes, turning it into hatred for any racial, ethnic, and religious group but their own. They despise Samaritans, thus Jesus' use of a good Samaritan in his parable, and called Gentiles dogs and probably other derogatory names. We do the same today. We will love our neighbors as long as they are friends or co-workers, or of the same race, ethnic group, or social status. We will love our neighbors if they follow our team, political views, or social causes. But that is not what God wants of us. This can be seen in the parable. The story is of a Jew traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho on business, a journey of about 15 miles. Robbers hold him up, beat him, and take everything he has, even his clothing, leaving him by the roadside half dead and bleeding. First, a man of his own nation, no less than a priest, a man who represents the love, compassion, tenderness, and kindness of God to the world, happens by. Of all people, one would think he would be the first to stop and help the battered traveler. Yet, he passes by on the other side, diverting his eyes, as if he never saw the man in need. Then comes a Levite, one whose God-given task was to serve in the temple. He not only sees the wounded man but also takes the time to walk over and examine him. But like the priest, he offers no help, scurrying to the opposite side of the road and continuing on his way. Finally, a despised Samaritan happens by, and his heart goes out to the suffering man. Without thought for himself, he begins to clean him, pouring wine on the wounds to disinfect them and oil to promote healing. Then, putting him on his beast, he walks beside it until they arrive at an inn where the injured man could receive care and rest. He spares no expense and promises to repay the innkeeper for his troubles in helping the man get back on his feet. Jesus ends the story, asking the rhetorical question, So which of these three was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? The lawyer, being an intelligent man whose training had been the proverbial straining out a gnat, now had to acknowledge the camel he had heretofore swallowed, Matthew 23, 24. With a simple story, Jesus had given him a broad picture of the intent of this second great commandment. So the lawyer answers, he who showed mercy on him. It was the Samaritan, loathed by the Jews as heretics and religious frauds, who forgot all the antagonisms and abuses against him and showed mercy, kindness, and care, love, to the wounded Jew lying helpless by the side of the road. Only he displayed the love of neighbor that God expects of his people. Jesus' instruction for the lawyer, and for us today, is, go and do likewise. Spiritually, this has been done for us. We, like this Jew in the ditch, were wounded unto death, left to waste away. The world passed us by, even those closest to us, and those who claimed to be God's representatives, never giving us the help we needed. Then God, despised by this world, walked by and tended to us, paying for our care. He paid the ultimate price, giving his only begotten son to save us and the whole world, John 3, 16, 17. We could say that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the pouring of wine and oil to disinfect and heal those wounded by sin. It enables sinners from every strata of society, upon belief and repentance, to be justified, to pursue sanctification, and ultimately, to be glorified. As we saw that both God the Father and Jesus Christ have modeled how we are to love one another. After giving the pattern in the life of Jesus shown in the Gospels, we are instructed to walk just as he walked. He who loves his brother abides in the light, 
and there is no cause for stumbling in him. I John 2 6 10. How we show love to our neighbors reveals whether we are walking in the light or not. God's instructions to Israel in Leviticus 19 help us learn the right perspective on loving our neighbors. Notice the first three verses. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, 1 to 3. Verse 2 is a kind of specific purpose statement for all of the nation of Israel then, and for the Israel of God today, Galatians 6:16. 6, God thunders that his people shall be holy, different and separate from the world around them, because God himself is holy. The people are to reflect the God they worship. When others see the people of God, they are to see an image of God himself in how they treat one another. In this way, God's people represent him to the world. So Jesus teaches his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 13, 14, 16. Then, in verse 3, God gives the first and most important of the physical instructions in how to treat others. It begins with one's parents, as they are the neighbors that children come into contact with first and most often. Children see their parents in the same way as we come to understand what God is to us, and we learn to love God by loving them. So our lessons in loving our neighbors happen within what should be the friendly confines of the family.